I was asked to speak tonight a little bit about tendonitis of the upper extremity. For those of you who may have uh, attended some of the other lectures, I've certainly spoken about some overuse syndromes in the past, like carpal tunnel, uh, spoken about arthritis. And this time, we're going to talk about uh, tendonitis. All righty. So what is tendonitis? Well, first of all, itis means inflammation. So if we're talking about arthritis, we're talking about inflammation of a joint. Tonsillitis is inflammation of your tonsils. Tendonitis, ipso facto, is inflammation of your tendons. And just for some clarity, what are tendons? Well, tendons are where muscles actually attach to the bone. So where is that? If you take a look at the picture of the arm down below, uh, you'll see the red stuff is the muscles and the white stuff is where the muscle turns into white sinewy tendons. I like to say it's an awful lot like chicken tenders uh, when you buy them in the supermarket. It's got that tough white strip that runs through it. Well, the tough white strip is actually the tendon uh, that comes out of the meat. And the reason that tough white tendon is there is that that's the part where the muscle attaches to the bone so that when that muscle contracts, it'll pull the joint and make it move or make it bend. So that's tendon and that's tendonitis. And by the way, I apologize, it's a, such a small group. I actually didn't start off by saying a little bit about myself, although maybe uh, some of you know me already uh, from the previous talks. Uh, I am Gina Del Savi, and the reason there's a picture of an arm there is because that's what I do. I am an orthopedic hand surgeon. I operate from the elbow down. Uh, I take care of all sorts of things from the elbow down, everything from fractures to tendon injuries, to nerve injuries, to lacerations, to infections, uh, to reconstructions. Uh, and so pretty much anything that can be done below the elbow, that's what I do. Uh, so it's more of a, a regional surgeon than a specific type of surgery. Uh, unlike some of my sports surgery colleagues who only do sports procedures or joint replacement surgeons who only do joint replacements, my only is, I only do from the elbow down, but I do anything below the elbow and down. So anyway, just to give you a little background on myself. So moving on about tendon and tendonitis. So how does tendonitis happen? Well, that inflammation can happen because of a single trauma, right? You're walking through a doorway and you whack your wrist on the side of the door jam as you walk through and you hit your tendon and create some inflammation. It can happen from a repetitive trauma, uh, i.e. you go decide to go out on a fishing trip one day and you don't normally go fishing and over and over again, you, you throw out the rod and you bring it back. You throw out the rod and give you back over and over and over again, which is repetitive trauma and the next day or later that day, you're gonna be sore. And then the other problem is overuse. And that can be from things like uh, standing online, like working as a line worker, like you see here. And all day long, you do the same task over and over and over again, using the same motion, the same muscles, the same tendons, and therefore can create inflammation. So other risk factors include uh, advanced age. And you might say, well, that doesn't seem so fair. Well, the problem is, is that as we become older, our tissues become less flexible. And I think we all know that from sort of practical examples that you lose some of your flexibility as you get older. But, but why do you use your, lose your flexibility? Well, sometimes it can be because of arthritis, meaning that you have inflammation or breakdown of the cartilage on your joint. Maybe it's because you start to stiffen up your ligaments, which are the tissues that can connect bone to bone. It has nothing to do with muscle, but bone to bone. But it also can be because you get stiffening or you get less flexibility uh, in your muscles and your tendons, either because you decrease your activities, you're not stretching as much, you're not as active, but also simply because as your tissues sort of uh, age out as well. And then of course, underlying medical conditions can also increase your risk for developing inflammation. And it's not just getting the inflammation, but it's also your ability to heal inflammation. What's the common story between diabetes and thyroid issues? They both affect the smallest of the small blood vessels called capillaries. And those smallest of the small blood vessels don't work very well anymore. And you know what's responsible for healing your tendons? The smallest of the smallest blood vessels. So if you have a disorder which damages those vessels in some way, if you irritate or aggravate your tendon, you have a decreased ability to heal that tendon uh, and make it get better on its, on its own. So how do you prevent, right? Because that's always the first thing. I mean, you know, well, it's easy enough to treat stuff, but real, the real issue is how do we prevent it from happening in the first place? So one of those is to 
be mindful and ease up. Whenever you find yourself doing an activity, which you recognize is putting excessive stress over your tendons for a long period of time, ease up, stop, rest, take some free, some frequent breaks. Mixing it up. Don't do just one activity. Well, I really like to do my dumbbells for my biceps. Okay, that's fine. But if you do 100 of those a day, every day, you're going to get some sort of overuse syndrome. Maybe some days you work your biceps with one kind of muscle workout. Another day you work your biceps with another. Maybe you work, move on to your triceps uh, or your uh, lats. So you mix it up in terms of which muscle groups you're working. So you're not mixing the, using the same groups every single day. Improving your technique, you know, especially with COVID, we've all spent a lot more time in our houses, maybe uh, doing stretches and doing workouts. The upside of that is it's much less expensive than going to a gym and it's certainly easier to be compliant. But the bad news is, is that you don't have a, a trainer or some professional who you could say, hey, am I doing this the right way? So again, uh, uh, before you start a new exercise regimen, uh, be really careful, maybe seek advice if you can, or even go to a gym once to try and get some advice. Stretching. Stretching before exercise is okay, but stretching after exercise is super duper important. While those muscles are all warmed up and those tendons have been worked out, stretching them is actually a great way to avoid uh, uh, tendonitis. Ergonomics, again, this is about that repetitive activity stuff. Uh, if you do anything, whether it's a hobby or your job, where you're sort of sitting in one position for a long period of time, uh, consider the ergonomics. Is your back in a good place? Are your elbows in a good place? Are your shoulders in a good place? Are you having to tilt your head in an awkward position? Are you having to hold your arms close to your body? Can you work far away from your body? Have you spaced out your hands? So think about your workstation, whether it's crafting or it's your job. Uh, think about uh, proper workstation ergonomics. And then, of course, last but not least, be prepared. If you're going to do something uh, uh, repetitively, well, gosh, work up to it by strengthening your muscles. Your muscles being strong will absolutely support your tendons and limit your ability to get uh, tendonized because your muscles will take up some of the load rather than your tendons bearing all of the load. So if you're not successful at prevention, right, and that's what my office is full of, if you're not successful, if all else fails, come on and see an orthopedic surgeon. Although I can promise you, we probably don't have a stethoscope around your neck, but what I couldn't find was a, a doctor without a stethoscope around their neck, but that was a girl. But anyway, so you're going to come see the orthopedic surgeon. And what are we going to do to try to figure out what's going on? Well, this is what I tell our medical students. First of all, listen to the words that a patient uses to describe your symptoms. You may not be physicians, but you know what you're feeling. And you know what? I can't feel what you're feeling. I can't necessarily touch you and recreate what you're feeling. So I need to really listen to you and the words that you're using. And I need to ask you very proactively, what have you figured out makes things worse? Then I have to use my eyes. Right? It's not just about poking and, and, and making you move. Look, the, the good news is, is that, you know, at least on your extremities, which is where most tendonitis happens, you've got two sets of them. So do a comparison. You know, does one side look different than the other? Is there any deformity, whether that's swelling or redness or angulation that we don't see in other places? Then, of course, there is always the touching part, which is why telemedicine is sort of a challenge for orthopedic surgeons. Why? Because, you know, even if I've listened to all of your words and I can look at your extremity over a telemedicine, at the end of the day, most of my diagnosis is finalized and confirmed by me touching you where I think your pain should be based on what I heard and saw and confirming that that is actually the part, the part of your body where, or that part of your anatomy where the problem is so that I can direct some kind of treatment. Range of motion, active and passive. You know, so well, well, what's the difference? Well, active is I say to you, hey, bend your elbow, and you do this, all right? Or passive is I say, let your arm go limp like a spaghetti, and I bend your elbow, right? And that's going to give you two types of pain. If I just bending your elbow without you using your muscles hurts, it's probably in, a problem inside of your joint. If you say no, doctor, when you passively move it, it's not so terrible, but when you make me move my elbow and I have to recruit my muscles, my tendons, then it's more likely to be muscular or tendonitis type problem. X-rays, 
Not always, but sometimes we do need to get x-rays depending on where the tendon pain is. And sometimes part of the differential diagnosis or hmm, what are the one or two things that are most likely to be wrong based on where you're sore, sometimes an x-ray can be helpful. And other times special tests like MRIs and CAT scans, but really, really infrequently. Those tests are really when I really feel befuddled and you really failed every treatment based on some preliminary diagnosis. But in general, MRIs are not part of the workup of just uh, plain old fashioned uh, tendinitis. So again, they always have to take a good complaint history. Uh, listen to what your main complaint is. I'll, I'll often say to folks, you're, you're describing a lot of things to me, but what is the thing that made you go pick up the phone and call me, right? What was the thing you said? I can't take this anymore. I got to see somebody. Why did you call me? And then I want to hear about, did it happen you woke up one morning or did it happen after, a, after you did a hike or did it happen uh, after you took a nap? Or did it happen while you were driving your car? What was the thing that sort of stimulated this? Or hey, has this been going on for two friggin' years and you just couldn't take it anymore and that's why you're coming to see me, right? Are there associated symptoms? Is there tingling? Is there numbness? Is you have your main pain in your wrist joint, but gosh, it radiates all the way up to your neck. Had you ever broken anything? Did you ever actually injure this body part? Even if it was 10 years ago, I want to know about that. I want to do a review of systems. What else is bothering you? Also having irritable bowel problems? Gosh, sometimes inflammatory disorders can be part of an inflammatory larger disorder, like, like uh, and, and you have your colitis is linked to the fact that your joint is inflamed. Your past medical history, like we talked about diabetes and thyroid problems, past surgical history, your medications, your allergies, what do you do for a living? What do you like to do for fun? And are you a new mom? Those are all things that are important. And when you say new mom, um, your hormones change uh, after a pregnancy, and that can uh, render your tendons uh, more or less vulnerable to injuries as well. So when we talk about range of motion, things like the elbow only go in two directions, uh, and, and fingers really only go in three, it go in four directions, right? You can open and close them, you can spread them apart, you can bring them together. The wrist, we forget, it also has a bunch of motions up, down, rotating, and sideways. So all of those motions are important because why? Different joints do different things, different tendons do different things. And so looking at all those motions is gonna be very, very helpful to determine where the problem lies. And then as we talked about touching, uh, those of you who, uh, if anybody has seen me as a patient, you know I, there's probably about 14 different places that I can touch around your wrist. Why? Because I'm looking for where the problem is. And I know that there's some standard areas. And when I touch you, I'm not just touching you randomly. I'm touching you at a very, very particular joint or over a very, very particular tendon. Again, trying to figure out what's going on. And does it hurt where I touch you? Or when I touch you, does it cause pain to radiate? Um, when I touch you, maybe it's not sore, but it feels kind of soft and cushiony when I touch there. Or does it feel really hard? Or is there an obvious deformity? Is it hot? Is it cold? All right. So at the end of the day, when we figure out that you do have tendonitis, and I'm not jumping to the end, I just want to let you know that as, a, as an orthopedic surgeon, we have a rather limited toolbox uh, when it comes to treatment of things like tendonitis. And so I figured I'd tell you the toolbox first, because otherwise I'd be repeating myself over and over and over again as we go through some specific conditions. So the first, when we talked about prevention is rest and activity modification. If between the two of us, we can figure out what the hay aggravated this in the first place. Maybe it's your brand new car and how you rest your arm on the console. Uh, maybe it's your new chair uh, and how you pull the lever to get your legs up at the end of the night to watch TV. Maybe it's your new cell phone is slightly bigger or smaller than your old one. And it's how you position your thumbs as you do your, your text messaging or play Candy Crush. But whatever the heck we figure it out, trying to modify those activities and doing what you still need to do uh, or resting the extremity. Splinting, not a really big, huge fan of splinting, but if you have a rip roaring tendonitis, rest, one way to rest you is to splint the body part appropriately. Therapy, things like occupational therapy or physical therapy, having someone do things like ultrasound, DP, massage, passive and active stretching exercises, strengthening, all those things can also help with inflammation that's inside your tendons. Then of course, there's the oral anti-inflammatories. I have a whole bunch of selections up there. Everybody's pretty familiar with things like, you know, ibuprofen and naproxen, right? Aleve and Advil. 
Um, now, don't get me wrong, Tylenol is very is a very good analgesic, meaning that it takes down pain, but it's not really an anti-inflammatory. The drugs that you see listed here, which are basically all fall into the same categories as ibuprofen and Aleve, these are truly anti-inflammatories. And if you have an inflamed tendon, these are probably the preferable drugs. Now, I put the word risk here because when I started in practice 25 years ago, almost nobody was on blood thinners. So I didn't have to include this as part of a talk. Nowadays, I swear to the Lord, 20% of the patients who come to see me in the practice are on blood thinners. Well, guess what? You can't take anti-inflammatories if you're on blood thinners. Blood thinners, whether it's Eliquis, Berlinta, Lovenox, Coumadin, I think I'm forgetting one and I'm sorry if I am, but those blood thinners, if you're on any of those blood thinners, they do the same thing that anti-inflammatories do inside your bloodstream around how you clot. And so you absolutely cannot be on a blood thinner and also take an anti-inflammatory, all right? So if, if you think, you oh, I can take it here and there, eh, you shouldn't. And the reason for that, you're already on a medication that if you were to have a head injury, uh, you could bleed and, and give yourself a permanent stroke or damage if you were to have some sort of accident or God forbid you had a car accident and uh, you cut yourself seriously, you could bleed out because you'd lose your ability to clot. So being very, very careful around using anti-inflammatories and if you're on a blood thinner, even if they're over the counter. Cortisone injections. Now, what do cortisone do? Well, cortisone, I like to say, like grinding up a motion and putting it right where the problem is, right? If you take a motion, it's got to go into your stomach, then it's got to go into your bloodstream, and then it goes everywhere in your whole entire body, even though maybe you only need it right here. A little bit of a waste, a little bit hard on your kidney, a little bit hard on your tummy. Cortisone, on, on the other hand, is you take this little tiny needle and you put the medicine right where the pain is. Now, the good news is about this is that it doesn't bother your stomach. It doesn't interfere with your blood thinners, and it can be extremely effective. The bad news is, is that the way cortisone works is it stops new cells from forming, right? Pain is, and inflammation is part of new cells being grown. It's a cellular process. And what cortisone does is it stops cells from forming. You might say, well, right, that's why I'm going to take care of my pain. But wait, wait, wait. That tendon, whether it's your, your, your patella tendon, your triceps tendon, or your finger tendon, the tendons that you have today are not the same tendons that you had five years ago. Every day, cells die, new ones come. Cells die, new ones come. And we depend on that life cycle to keep our tendons relatively healthy. If I put cortisone repeatedly into the exact same spot, it prevents new cells from forming. Doesn't stop cells from dying. So eventually the tendon will weaken, 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 and may eventually rupture. So cortisone is a great tool, but you have to use it very judiciously and not too close apart, not too close together uh, to avoid some complications. Surgery, well, I'm a surgeon. There's almost always a surgical option for uh, any form of tendonitis, but truly, 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 that's really after people have failed all of these other treatments. So the question is always, but will it just go away by itself? Yeah, I mean, sure, plenty of you. I mean, I, I, everybody on this phone, everybody in this room has probably had, you know, ooh, that's achy, you know, and it may take weeks or it may take months, but it does seem to go away. Um, but there are risks to neglect. If that chronic pain keeps you from doing things that you want to or need to do, uh, that's, that's not appropriate, right? I mean, I've got people who've gotten frozen joints because it hurts to move the tendon so much in your shoulder that you walk around like this for two weeks. Well, the tendonitis goes away, but now you have a frozen shoulder that you need to go to therapy for. So, you know, that's one of the consequences. Increased need for surgery, right? If you, tr if you don't even try to do any of this stuff when the tendonitis is early on, well, it may get, not that it's too late to try the modalities, but they're less likely to be effective. And so you're going to increase your risk for me to need to go in there and do some sort of mechanical uh, treatment for the tendon rather than being able to rely on medicines to do it. And then, of course, as we talked about, you can certainly get tendon ruptures. As we go forward with the rest of the topics today, you're going to see a lot of tendonitis is around tendons having to squeeze through spaces that are too tight. That's why they get inflamed. 
Well, just as you can imagine, if I take took a rope and I and I dragged it repeatedly, you know, over the edge of this table, eventually that rope is going to rupture. Well, the same thing can happen with a tendon which is chronically compressed and you keep using it and you just sort of push through the pain is eventually that tendon can rupture from a combination of the internal inflammation and the friction that it's experiencing that caused the inflammation in the first place. So an example of what I've just described is something called de Quervain's tendonitis. And uh, uh, I'm going to just stand up and get a little bit closer to the camera because I think it's really it's really helpful to see here. When we're talking about a decrevain's tendonitis, what are we talking about here? What we're actually talking about is pain along this side of your wrist, okay? Along this side of your wrist, on this side, at the base of your thumb. And if there, if you can, and I'm going to try to show you here, if you look at my wrist, I'm going to try to get the light just right, you'll see that there's a big tendon here and there's some other tendons right here. And the tendons that are right here, they disappear. They disappear over this area of your wrist right here. Well, they don't actually disappear. They don't actually disappear. What happens is they enter in a very tight tunnel, which you can see on the screen there on the third picture down. And any time a tendon has to glide through a tight space, it's vulnerable to becoming inflamed. And so de Quervain's tendonitis is when the tendons that move your thumb get inflamed over the bone in your wrist. And one of the ways of diagnosing it is to stretch them. Put the thumb in somebody's palm of the hand and make them do that. If they have day it hurts like the dickens. Okay. And again, the problem is inflammation of the tendons as they travel through a tight tunnel. Related to that, and this is why telemedicine is a little bit hard for, the, for us uh, in orthopedics, is this picture on the right, the, the, the picture of the cartoon, the little band of tissue. So if you, if you take a look at this right here, that, if that's where the inflammation is, that's the decrevain's tendonitis that we we're just talking to a minute ago. But sometimes another, there's another source of problem, and that's the friction where this tendon scissor over each other in your arm. And that's only a centimeter or so above where the decrevain's tendonitis is, and it's the exact same tendons. So again, one of the tests for it is stretching those tendons and grabbing the wrist down, and it's going to recreate this intersection syndrome. But in this particular case, the problem is a little bit higher up the arm uh, here than it is down here. And of course, that would change where we would want the therapist to focus their attention. Or if we were going to give you a cortisone injection, we might uh, change your cortisone, put your cortisone. Trigger fingers are another example of a tendon traveling through a space that's too tight. Uh, what happens is and that all of our fingers, I'm just going to come up to the camera again one more time for you here. When we look at uh, fingers, we really have uh, two tendons. We have one that bends the very tip of the finger, and then we have another one that bends the big knuckle of the finger. So there's two tendons, and those tendons start on muscles way up here in the top of your forearm here. And what happens is, is that those muscles, the red meaty muscles, turn into those sinewy tendons, those chicken tenders, which come through your carpal tunnel and then go out to the tips of your bones to attach. So that when you flex your muscles, your tendons bend. Well, to bend your fingers, those tendons have to glide in and out of your fingers. And in the hand, if you take a look at the cartoon now, what you'll see is that the base of each of the fingers is a tight little tunnel, all right? These are called pulleys. So as those tendons glide in and out, in and out, so again, you can get inflammation and get a size match where the tendon is a little swollen or the sheath is a little tight. And guess what happens now? You end up with a finger that's stuck in, the, in your palm and you actually have to use your other hand to straighten it out, all right? And you'll feel a snapping or a jerking as you do that. This is usually worse when you first wake up in the morning, you wake up in your hands in a fist and you're like, oh, my, all my fingers in except for, ow that one and you pop it open and maybe it clicks for a couple of hours in the morning. And then as you sort of lubricate it up during the day, it gets a little bit better, but it's always a little sore in the palm of your hand. So that is a trigger finger. All righty. Um, now there are other causes uh, for trigger fingers. I'm sorry, I forgot about that. And what the other uh, cause for a trigger finger is this. On the back of the hand, if you look at uh, your, your own hand, you'll see the ropes or the tendons that open, that extend your fingers, right? So if you really extend your fingers, you can see these ropes on the back of your hand. And those are also tendons. Now, those tendons can get inflamed and they can displace or sublux off the top of your knuckle. So instead of going over the top of your knuckle, they fall off to the side. And that's a whole different reason for why when you make a fist, and you try to strengthen it up, you can't strain it up. 
Now, the difference is here is that you won't feel pain in the palm of your hand when you open it up. In fact, it won't hurt at all. It feel almost like to be a relief to straighten the finger up because that brings that tendon back in the middle. So that's an extensor tendon tendonitis that can also give you triggering. Now, unfortunately, this is one of the rare forms of tendonitis, which I can't make better without fixing because this now is a matter of something ruptured. So as a surgeon, I have to go in there. I find that tendon off to the side. I put it back in the middle and I make it stay there to fix it. So that's one of the rare forms of tendonitis where unfortunately uh, surgery is actually the answer. Tennis elbow. So everybody's heard of tennis elbow. Uh, not what, every, what everybody doesn't necessarily know is that it's not a problem with the muscles of your elbow. So tennis elbow is more descriptive of why you get it, i.e. having a crappy backhand, all right? You're holding the racket and when you when you hit the ball, you 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 extend your wrist forcibly, which you're not supposed to do when you know tennis, right? You're supposed to swing through cleanly. But if you cheat or the ball, you're not very strong and the ball hits that racket and it forces your wrist down because you, you know, your, your 16 year old nephew managed to plunk that ball at you at 120 miles an hour. So when it hits your racket, your, your wrist gets forced into flexion because you're not used to balls being hit you that hard. That could also uh, create a trauma here and create little micro tears uh, at the top of the tendon at your elbow, and that will give you pain on the outside. So when people come in, they're rubbing the outside of their elbow. Oh my God, they say, this is where it hurts. This is where it hurts to move my elbow. But the thing is, is that that muscle doesn't move your elbow. What that muscle actually does is lift your wrist, which is why you'll see a wrist brace is actually the answer for tennis elbow. You can certainly wear a strap on the elbow. We call that an interference brace. The idea behind that is if you squeeze the muscle right there by putting pressure right there. Now, when I wiggle my fingers and I move my wrist, the brace will absorb the force rather than tugging at that inflamed area of my muscle up by the bone. But it still is a wrist and finger tendon problem, not an elbow problem. So it's a little bit of a misnomer. So again, for tennis elbow, pain on the outer elbow, usually aggravated by lifting with your palm down, like taking your purse up off the floor or taking a file out of a file cabinet, but you can lift the firewood like this and it won't bother you in the slightest, all right? So pain on the outer elbow, aggravated by lifting palm down. And just to remember, it's really a problem with your wrist extensors. So some oral anti-inflammatories and a wrist brace would be the first way to go. All right, and this is in contradistinction to medial epicondylitis, the word medial referring to the inside or middle part of your elbow. And again, now that's gonna be sore as people come in and they're rubbing the inside of your elbow. Now, again, this is where history is important because the most common cause for inside elbow pain is actually a nerve entrapment, but that comes along with numbness and tingling. So if someone tells me they have pain here with no numbness or tingling, it's most likely medial epicondylitis, also known as golfer's elbow. And that's, of course, when you swing the golf club, if you dip it into the ground, it forces your arm this way and, again, can irritate the muscles. Now, it's the same idea here. It's not the muscles of your elbow. It's the muscles in your hand. So this time, it's the muscles that flex your fingers and flex your wrist. So when you bring your wrist forward, that will aggravate. So in this kind of tendonitis, you'll have inner elbow pain when you do lift the logs up. You're going to feel it right here. You're going to want to turn your palm over and lift this way so that you don't aggravate it quite as much. And then the other big muscle around your elbow is your biceps inflammation. Now, the biceps, everybody thinks of Popeye, right? It's the Popeye muscle. And the biceps tend to can actually have tendonitis in two spots. Up here in your shoulder, it's part of your rotator cuff, which that's one of my sports specialists would take care of. Or it can happen down here at the bottom of your elbow, where that attaches to your forearm bone. And that's why when you flex your muscle, like Popeye, you bend your elbow forward. It's attached to these bones. And as you pull your muscle, you're pulling your elbow up. And that can create inflammation where that muscle attaches inside your forearm and give you tendonitis there. So that pain is going to be up here high in the middle of your forearm. And again, it's going to be aggravated by lifting with your palm up. But one other thing, that muscle is also really, really responsible for rotating your palm. So for instance, if you were tightening a screw, righty-tighty, that's the motion, righty-tighty with your, with your right hand, that motion of tightening the screw will also piss off that tendon like nobody's business, all right? Now, 
If you've got tendonitis, maybe because you've been helping your kids move into college, uh, and so you get home on Monday and you go, damn, my elbow's really killing me from carrying the kids' refrigerator, their mattresses, and everything else. Okay, so that's just a simple tendonitis. But now if your neighbor comes over and says, hey, I just bought a new TV. Can you help me get that into my house? So now you've got a little bit of tendonitis in your elbow and you say, sure, I'll be happy to help you so I can watch the game on the, your big brand new ski TV. You see the guy at the bottom with the black t-shirt on and the black hat? He's in a very precarious position because if that young lady wearing the blue Belmont t-shirt drops her end of that heavy item, he's doing the perfect motion for rupturing his biceps tendon. All right. Now, what do I? Th what, what's he doing? He's carrying something very heavy, so he's firing his biceps. He's firing that muscle is is exerting itself incredibly. All right, and he's got his elbow a little bit bent. Now, while he's firing that muscle as hard as he can to carry this item, she drops her end, and all of the weight of that now forces his arm straight. So the the act of him firing his muscle actively while passively being extended because of the dropping of the weight. That's how you rupture tendon. It's how you rupture Achilles tendon, right? You're under a lot of pressure in your Achilles tendon playing basketball and someone comes up against you and shoves you. That's how you rupture your Achilles tendon. It's when you're firing your muscle to the max and some outside force comes along and forces the muscle to stretch while it's firing. So again, you're much more vulnerable to that happening if you have tendonitis. But unfortunately, it can happen even if you don't have tendonitis, if the refrigerator is heavy enough uh, and the person drops it hard enough on the stairs. So as I said, surgery, most people do get better with all these problems with some anti-inflammatory, some activity modification, physical therapy, the occasional cortisone injection. But if those things fail, certainly surgery is an option. Now, what do we do for each of these problems? We treat the mechanical problem. So for instance, in that gay cravains, if you've got pressure here at the wrist, I release that little bit of tissue that's constraining your tendons. If it's a trigger finger and that's where the pressure is, I make a little incision and I release that pulley that your tendon is traveling through. If it's your tendonitis at your elbow, that is, I go in and that's where there's the muscle has pulled itself off the bone. I strip down all the nasty muscle that's been torn and I create a new healthy bed for it to heal. Unfortunately, medial epicondylitis or golfer's elbow, there is no surgical treatment. Unfortunately for, uh, well, for fortunately for biceps tendon, as long as it's tendonitis, we can treat it. But if you rupture your biceps tendon, that's not going to heal itself. You may be able to get functional with some therapy and we still don't necessarily not recommend that. But unfortunately, to get you back to full strength, we certainly would have to do a repair of those biceps tendon. So everything we do on tendons is same day surgery nowadays. Nothing is an overnight stay. Most of this can be done except at the elbow. The elbow is general anesthesia, but anything in the wrist and the hand is a local anesthetic with a twilight anesthesia. And although recovery is slightly variable, ranging from two weeks for a trigger finger to three months for a, for a biceps tendon, think about the bigger the tendon is, the longer it takes for it to become uh, healthy enough to get back to full activities. But still, uh, honest and true, recovery for tendonitis surgery is always quicker than having to treat a repaired rupture. So to keep that in mind when you're thinking about when to seek help. So in closing, an ounce of protection is always worth a pound of cure. If you find yourself babying something, splinting something, trying some over-the-counter anti-inflammatories, modifying your activities, and you're still not getting better, don't be afraid to seek some help. Uh, um, we often at times can prevent this from getting worse and get you back to doing the things that you want to and need to do. And again, most tendonitis is curable uh, with non-surgical measures. And then unfortunately, if, even if you do need to go to surgery, again, we're curing. It's not like arthritis where we're doing a joint replacement. We're not curing your arthritis, right? We're giving a substitute joint. That's different in tendonitis. We're actually curing your tendonitis uh, when we do the uh, surgery. So again, recurrence is very, very low.